Okay, recording. Um, hello everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for tonight's archeology span event. Uh, first, I want to welcome our invited speakers and students who are coming from all over, welcome. Uh, second, I want to wish everyone a happy International Archaeology Month, which as many of you know, takes place during the month of October. Um, I am Dr. Meredith Reischneider and I will be moderating tonight's event. And again, uh, a welcome to So You Want to Be an Archaeologist. Um, so the goal of tonight's conversation is to introduce the discipline of archaeology via an informal discussion with our four invited speakers. We are joined by archaeologists who are, represent the breadth of archaeology. They work in different sectors of archaeology, including cultural resource management and academia. Our discussions tonight aim to provide students with practical knowledge and advice about archaeology as a major and or as a career. So I will be moderating the discussion tonight and asking our guests a series of open-ended questions concerning their education and background in archaeology, what kinds of experiences and knowledge their jobs require, and what advice they might offer students who are interested in pursuing archaeology. I understand everyone's busy schedule, so I'll aim to keep this event to one hour. Uh, please do save your individual questions for the end, and we will have about 15 to 20 minutes um, for student questions and discussion. So first, I want to start by introducing our guests. First is Dr. Lie Xie, who is an associate professor in anthropology at the University of Toronto. Lie, do you want to say a quick hi? Thank you, Marlis. Yeah. Um, we are also joined by Megan Trowbridge, who is a cultural resources project manager and principal investigator at Swika Environmental Consultants. So nice to see everybody. We also welcome Laura Ng, who is a recent PhD graduate in archaeology from Stanford University. Hi, everyone. Hi, Laura. And I'm happy to welcome Christopher Singer, who is an MA student in anthropology here at San Francisco State University and an archaeologist and project manager at Paleo West. Hello, everyone. Hi, Chris. So welcome again, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, we are thrilled to have you here to share your experiences and your expertise with us. Um, but I first want to start tonight's conversation by doing a quick round of introductions. Um, we'd appreciate if you can uh, please share your name, your title again, and also a brief description of your work. Uh, we will have some time, obviously, later in this conversation to get into some of the details. Um, but just a quick little high end introduction, if you would. Chris, okay. we're going to start with, oh, Lie, we're going to start with oh. you. You talked first. I thought, I thought you mentioned me first, but I did, I, okay I did, but I saw Chris Lie. on my screen. <laughs> Take it away, Lie. Okay, so I'm Lie Xie. I'm an associate professor and in, at the University of Toronto in the Department of Anthropology. And I study pre-industrial technologies, including bone tools, Snow tools, which sound pretty boring to many people, but I found it very exciting. <laughs> and then also more recently, I study ancient earthen constructions in the early cities in China to and study these technologies and construction process to understand the development of agriculture, um, cities and states in ancient China, basically before 1500 BCE. So I teach, you know, clearly I teach undergraduate and graduate course at Toronto, and I normally go back to China for field work to do survey excavation, and most importantly, my highlight, experimental archaeology in China, almost every summer, not, not the last two, um, and for clear reasons, um, I couldn't go just because of the things going on. So I think I, I will leave this to if any, if any questions, I'm happy to answer after everyone introduce ourselves. Yeah. All right, Meg, let's go in order of introductions. Cool. You're up. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, as Meredith said, my name is Megan Trowbridge. Um, I work for SWCA Environmental Consultants. People know us as SWCA. Um, 
I'm in the Albuquerque, New Mexico office, and I'm a project manager, principal investigator. I think technically my title is lead archaeologist, but that kind of encompasses a lot of different hats that I play in my role here. Um, my, I guess we'll talk about education background and stuff in other questions, but I won't get into that now. But yeah, I've been doing this um, at the level I'm currently at for years now. Um, I've worked all over Arizona and New Mexico in different capacities. Um, I went to grad school with both Meredith and Lie in Arizona, and my specialty, like kind of my specialized analysis um, category would be ceramics. I'm a ceramic analyst, and so I get to do some of that with work, um, but I went straight to the CRM side of things, and I'm happily set it there for the future. That's where I'm at. So. Thanks, Meg. Uh, next up, we have Laura. Hi. I uh, just got my PhD at Stanford University, which is how I know Meredith. And uh, I am currently a uh, visiting instructor at Grinnell College. I teach archaeology classes and an intro to, intro to anthropology course. And I am uh, well, I do research on Chinese migration and more specifically transnationalism, how people, uh, migrants who moved back and forth between the U.S. and China during the late 19th, early 20th century, how they um, built communities both in the U.S. Uh, and how they maintain ties to their home villages in China. So I look at um, villages in Guangdong province in the Taishan, Toisan, Hoisan area, and also Chinatowns in Southern California. So uh, happy to answer any questions about applying to graduate school or um, how to uh, get your foot in the door because I've also worked in, in, in CRM, also in for the National Park Service in done research in all over, kind of, kind of all over the place, but yeah. Thank you, Laura. Um, and then last but not least, of course, we have Chris. Thank you. Hi, everyone. As Meredith said, my name is Christopher Singer. I'm a third year uh, bioarchaeology master's student at SF State. Um, studying the plausibility of pre-contact leprosy in North America. So I'm very much in my thesis writing at the moment. But in addition, I'm also a archaeologist project manager with archaeological historical consultants. I started my career with PaleoS, but I've since moved on to another firm. Um, and as similar to what Megan said before, large wide swath of duties with, um, within CRM that I'm responsible for, including um, field work, directing field work, reporting, et cetera. And looking forward to share my experiences with you all. All right, thanks, Chris. Thank you all for your introductions. Um, so I have a series of targeted questions and most of them um, will apply to, well, I'll direct my question at, at each of you in turn, um, but feel free uh, at the end to um, jump in if you have any information or, or thoughts to add. Um, so I'm actually gonna skip one of my questions <laughs> for the sake of time. So let's start with uh, Megan. Um, as you said, do you work in CRM or cultural resource management? Uh, which is where the majority of archaeologists work here in the United States. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about what CRM is, uh, which I understand is a huge question, uh, and what your career as a CRM archaeologist looks like, what types of projects do you manage, um, and what agencies or organizations do you consult with in your role um, as a cultural resource management archaeologist? Sure. Um, that's kind of a lot. It's one. a big, big <laughs> question. <laughs> I think the, the question you just asked would be like, you know, an hour long lecture, just even just scraping the surface. So I'll do what I can here. Um, so yeah, I mean, like Mer Meredith said, um, probably the vast, you know, the majority of archaeologists in this country work in the CRM sector, the cultural resource management sector. Um, basically, the way I kind of very simply describe that to a lot of people is 
you know, there are, there's legislation in place in this country that protects archeological cultural resources. Whenever there are projects that happen in this country, whenever there is development, whenever there are, whenever there are things that involve development of public lands, federal lands, really any lands, um, there are rules that, you know, we have developers and private contractors and transmission companies and pipeline companies and the federal agencies, everyone has to follow a certain set of rules to ensure the protection and preservation of cultural resources. And so within CRM, like for instance, I work for an environmental consulting company. My company doesn't just do archeology, span we do the full suite of environmental compliance. So we follow NEPA regulations, which is, um, you know, we cover natural resources, paleontology, wetland delineation, I mean, you name it, any, under that kind of umbrella of um, environmental resources. And so archeology span is a large part of that, and that's what I do. Um, and so we work with all different agencies or federal agencies, like the BLM, the Forest Service, US Army Corps of Engineers, we work with state agencies. Every state has a historic preservation, state historic preservation officer, which is responsible for the cultural resources within that particular state. Um, depending on the land on which a project occurs, you may follow federal guidelines, you may follow state guidelines. Um, and all of that comes down to, as a consultant, I work for my clients, which oftentimes is a private entity, it's like a developer, a like I said, a transmission company, somebody's building a new airport, the Department of Transportation needs to widen the highway. If that case, before they are allowed to do anything, there are regulations that say that we have to conduct archaeological clearance. And so we're going to send our crews out there. There's different phases of a project, you know, that we may have to do a survey. We're going to go literally physically walk the ground that those people are planning to develop to ensure that there's no cultural resources we can identify on the surface of that project area. And if there are, that may have implications for those, those projects. Um, they may have to reroute their pipeline because they can't disturb a significant site. They may have to pay a lot of money to have a site excavated because they can't reroute their project. And so instead of preserving that site in place, we're gonna preserve as much of the data we can from that site and collect, we call it data recovery. We're gonna collect every bit of data and information we can from that site because it's gonna be destroyed by this project. And so that's our way of preserving whatever we can from that site. Um, so that's kind of, that's kind of probably the majority of what we do is kind of that, that pipeline of, or of services. Um, but I mean, myself, I, a project manager, so I'm doing you know, administrative stuff and logistics, but I'm also a principal investigator, which means I'm handling research side of projects. And so I do contract work, but the company I work for is also very research-based and science-based. So we, we still do get to do a little bit of research. I mean, it's not on the same level as an academic project and somebody who's coming up with million dollar grants and giving money to go and do all these specialized analyses. We don't necessarily get to do that, but we still we still are doing as much research as we can put in within within these projects that we're doing um, to to get the science out there um, and to publish things when we can and make that data available. Um, I'm sure, I glossed over parts of it, but that's that's the very basics of CRM. I think Chris could probably jump in and add some pieces if I missed some things that are important. <laughs> Yeah, I think you gave a really excellent rundown of it. Um, I think also CRM is doesn't just deal with like very large projects like going on surveys for large pipelines or for high speed rail or for freeways that are being built. They can also be very local and small or just um, doing historical or sensitivity analysis of when like a house is being built or like in the city of San Francisco, when a large skyscraper is going up, we were looking around that area, look at historical documents to determine what may have been there before. So it covers the whole spectrum of projects. Yeah, thank you, Megan. Thank you, Chris. Um, Megan, that was a, a beautiful and very well put uh, rundown of an enormous uh, field of practice <laughs> and a lot of really useful information. Um, and I appreciated that you mentioned the research side of, of CRM as well, and that the potential for research does exist. 
um, because I think that that's often overlooked um, by students and, and, and folks who are interested in, in pursuing um, cultural resource management. So um, I think that's really, really important to talk about. Um, Chris, so while I have you here, I have a question for, for you now, um, which I think will be a nice segue. So uh, you work in two capacities, both as a graduate student here at State um, in anthropology and as an archaeologist for a CRM company. Um, I'm wondering if, I, if you can talk a bit about how you navigate your responsibilities um, as a student and as a professional archaeologist since both of these roles are obviously very demanding in regard to time and energy. Um, and I'm also wondering if you find your work as a CRM archeologist informs your graduate research or vice versa. Um, and I'm asking you this because this is a question that I get a lot from students here. Um, can you work in both capacities? If so, how, um, and what are some of the ways you can make both of these articulate with each other? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the first, First thing I can definitely say is it is possible to do both at the same time. It is, as you said, it is a lot of time management and understanding your limits and your boundaries of what you're capable of getting done because there's only so much. I mean, it, we like to talk about it all comes down to time and maybe time is not everything, but making sure that when you're in both in school and working that you have enough time for both doing your work and also getting your studies done and you're spending a good amount of time that you're putting out um, really thoughtful and important work so i would not personally I'll say is i would not be able to work do both at the same time if it wasn't for the help of my employers as well they've all the people that i've worked for have been very understanding and of my situation and so they want to help make that work and utilize me in both in work in the field and in the office doing background research and reporting, but also making sure that I'm also getting my, getting my education, which will further help me down the line. Um, so I think that's the first question you asked. I'm trying to remember the second, other two questions you asked. Well, oh, my with. second question was whether or not um, your work uh, sort of, it, you know, your work as, a, as an archaeologist, right, your professional work informs um, your, you know, intellectual work, if you will, or your work as a graduate student. Um, and if so, how, like, do you see um, these two parts of your life, how do you see them informing one another? Um, or do you? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for reiterating the question. Um, the methods and the tools that you learn in class, in, in undergrad and both uh, graduate school, are and will be and can be applied in the professional sphere. You learn how to do research. You learn how to do proper academic research in classes, which then translate over to the work that I do and that you will do in CRM after and vice versa, me working in the field, having my archeological hat on and doing analyses on artifacts that I find in the field and then uh, comparative analyses I do after field work um, helps me be a better researcher as well with my own work in the classroom and my thesis as well. So they're applicable in both ways. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, and we're, we're going to circle back to some of these topics uh, at the end, too. So um, for those of you who are our invited guests, uh, feel free to, to, to hold off for just a moment um, until we speak with everyone. Uh, so my next question is, is for Lie and also Laura. Um, since you both work in international contexts, um, Lie, I am familiar with your research, having known you for so long, but um, you have conducted field work and research at archaeological sites in different regions in China um, for many years now uh, and during your dissertation research phases. Um, and I was wondering if you could discuss some of the practical considerations of doing archaeological work internationally. What are some of the benefits? What are some of the challenges of this work? 
Um, if you want, you can talk about how the pandemic has affected your field work, although I do realize we're a bit exhausted of talking about the pandemic at this point in time. So you feel free to, to sort of elide that question. Um, and I do uh, would like to hear from Laura as well, since as you noted, you've worked in different regions in China throughout the course of your graduate career as well. So, okay, Th those are good questions. The first one is about the challenges in terms of conducting international work. For me, it's less of a struggle because I'm native Chinese and I speak the language, I know the people, I grew up there. So um, I think I imagine this is completely different if I am from the US, regardless of my ethnic background, and then I have to do the work in another country, I have to build connections you know, as a grown up and all of this. So for me, it's more of a, it's, it was more struggle as an international student, <laughs> less as a um, going back to China and do the work. I actually, even though it's exhausting in the field, I always feel excited and like, because like I get to speak my language, I get to eat my food, I get to, I know what I'm talking about. I know what other people are talking about, the facial expression, the body language. It's much easier for me in that environment. So there's always some, um, but then when I come back, I feel like, oh, it's like, it, it really satisfies different aspects of my need. And I feel like it's, it's a really nice combination for me. Um, I imagine if you are actually in East Asian, East Asian countries in general, um, Japan, Korea, Mongolia, China, Vietnam, all of these places, if you don't have the connection and you have to go as a researcher from as an outsider to do research, it would have been much, much more challenging. You won't be able to get permit. So that means you have to have a principal investigator in China, the local people, whatever original country you are working in, and then get permission through them. And so there, uh, it's, it's a lot more complicated in terms of the political process for you to get any work done or even um, allowed to do the work. Um, for certain areas in China, if it's close to the border, foreigners forget about it. There's no way the government will allow you to do surveys and whatever work, even though if um, even if it's completely academic, just archaeological work, nothing to do with the current situation, they're not going to um, give you permission, period. So, so that's that's a different story for me because I'm still Chinese citizen and I, I just it's just easier to go around. Um, so I, I'm I'm I don't I'm not sure if I answered that question to you. Yeah, Leah, that, yeah, you answered it really, really nicely. Um, and I wanted to return to this, this issue of permits and permissions, maybe in our discussion session at the end. Because um, again, this is a, this is another question I get from students a lot is, you know, um, as a national of this particular country, can I do like research here? Or can I do research abroad in a particular context? Um, if so, what is that research going to look like? Um, hopefully we'll have the chance to uh, to scale back a little bit and also talk about um, field schools and other training opportunities. Um, you know, the sort of like pre-dissertation stages, if you will, pre-researcher stages, uh, both, uh, you know, sort of domestic and international contexts as well, because that's another question that I think is, um, is often posed by students. But before we move on, I want to um, switch over to Laura. Laura, can you talk a little bit about your experiences um, working in China as well? Sure. I am not a Chinese citizen uh, or citizen of China. I, I was born in Los Angeles. So I grew up in an immigrant household. My parents spoke Chinese, can um, not exactly Cantonese. Uh, some it's a dialect called um, Taishanese or or in our dialect it's Hoisan, Hoisan Wa or Hoisan Wa, and basically um, that's that's where I've been doing my research because uh, my advisor and Meredith's advisor uh, had connections to to researchers in um, Wuyi University in Jiangmen in Guangdong Province. And basically, 
because of of the people there doing um, research on on home villages or Chaosha, there our interests intersected because uh, my advisor and myself were interested in Chinatowns, Chinese American communities in in the U.S. And we know that people uh, who who were Chinese migrants in living in Chinatowns or or even other contexts like um, laborers, laundry workers, uh, vegetable gardeners, these people moved back and forth. A lot of them did uh, throughout their whole lives to go back to China to marry, to go back to have a, to visit their their children, to visit um, sick relatives. And the opportunity to do research in China because of because these people at Wu Yi were already um, doing it was something that I I was attracted to um, because of my personal background because my parents come from the same area and I'm, I've uh, I have an interest in in Chinese American history Chinese diaspora archaeology so that's actually why I well part of the reason why I chose Stanford is the opportunity to go to China to the home village to do this research and honestly that's the only place i've been <laughs> in china i have not worked anywhere else and and not, not even traveled anywhere else but i mean with and 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 of course in china um as as um professor xia is saying um you know a lot of the archaeology is ancient um neolithic sites or, or ancient sites like kings like <laughs> important people and we're studying everyday people uh in villages and and people don't of course they don't think we're doing archaeology um the the people that we're we're talking to so that was kind of a challenge but also yeah the language barrier the people um the the stanford team like basically it was me and another person who who spoke chinese <laughs> so and then a, a, hist a chinese history professor too he came with us and and he's but he's fluent in mandarin and the villagers that were want to talk to they they can understand mandarin but they they won't speak it back to you they'll speak their own dialect and so i thought that was that was really i mean that showed the diversity of of, of the research or, or just the region of china and also like I was able to use my what I grew up speaking at home, which is really unusual because you can't even take a class in the in the dialect that I speak. You have to probably find a tutor or someone's grandmother to to talk to you. Anyway, but these I mean like I I I bet you know Toronto, Vancouver, all these places, everybody has that has a Chinatown. There was there were people that spoke this dialect. Sorry, I'm going on and on, but basically that's one of the biggest challenges for that particular project. And then the permit, um, that was an issue too. And honestly, we made a whole documentary about um, the not the project for my dissertation, but a project that my advisor and I worked on. Um, I'll put the link up here um, for everyone, it's because I want to promote <laughs> our documentary. So it's a changdeng.stanford.edu. So Changdeng is the village um, that we studied uh, and in, in, in Kaiping County. So my family is in, from the neighboring county. And um, yeah, if you want to know about the archaeological process, waiting for a permit, waiting for uh, permission to excavate or not, and collaborating with, with the, the Guangdong Bureau of Cultural Relics, that's again. That's what we had to do because we're foreigners. We're we're from Stanford. None of us are, are Chinese nationals. So that documentary talks about um, the challenges and then finally getting permission. So yeah, if you watch it, let me know what you think. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Laura, so much for for sharing your experiences, both you know, in your own dissertation research and also on. Um, on, on the bigger like Stanford project. And thanks for dropping the link in there. <laughs> I should have thought ahead and, and had it ready to go. It's oh, it's okay. Shame. It's a really, really good documentary. Um, and while I actually, while I have you here, I do have a question um, for you. And because we have a little bit of time, uh, I would actually like to hear from, from everybody on this, but Laura, 
Um, I'm targeting you for this question because I know I'm familiar with your work. I know you've done this kind of work in the past. Um, but just to sort of set up the question a little bit, uh, as many of you here know who have taken archaeology classes, who have experience in archaeology, uh, if you've taken archaeology with me, you already know this because we've had these conversations. But there has been a major shift in the discipline over the past maybe 15 or 20 years or so. Um, and if you think back to you know, the discipline of archaeology, maybe 50 years ago, 100 years ago, it was once thought of this you know, study of quote unquote dead cultures. Um, but recently there has been a shift as archaeologists recognize the importance of archaeological research and practice to living communities. Um, and as such, archaeologists now work with indigenous, descendant, and other stakeholder communities. And Laura, I know your dissertation research and your other work at Stanford has been very collaborative. Um, and I'm wondering if you could speak more about the importance of, of this kind of collaborative or community-based research in archaeology. Yeah, yes, definitely. I didn't realize the link I sent was probably not, not good, but I, I, I resent it. For sure, co collaborative archaeology, community-based archaeology, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> Things that like methods and and um, um, ways of of adding knowledge to your project that include descendants or or people who have a a stake in the research that you're doing. Um, so I worked closely with Chinese American descendants of the the villages and the Chinatowns that I'm studying. So that was kind of easy because in, in my case, I knew I could draw a line around who the community was. And in some cases you can't because um, you don't know the direct descendants of, of you know, the, the, the site that you're studying or the community you're looking at. And um, then you would probably work with people who have an interest who are, who are like in my case, um, if I couldn't find any descendants, I would probably go to the Chinese Historical Society of Southern California. This is a grassroots historical society um, comprised of Chinese Americans, founded by Chinese Americans, and they have an interest in preserving the history of of um, Chinatown sites and also um, creating kind of exhibits and, and speaker series. So that's who I would probably reach out to. But fortunately, I um, was looking at a community that had a, they, they had strong ties to each other. Um, and, and some of those ties have broken over time because people moved away to, to other cities and other towns. But their fathers and their grandfathers were really, um, really bounded together by this shared um, home village uh, area that they came from. And then the, the Chinatowns that they or their their, their fathers and grandfathers lived in were, were San Bernardino Chinatown and Riverside Chinatown. And in, in the 1902, during my research, I found that people had created this completely new village with all the money they had earned in China. I mean, sorry, in the US and, and created, um, you know, what, what they thought was modern uh, houses for their families that they had left behind. And um, so this uh, this research I'm doing is, is really kind of bounded by these the people who are connected to those communities. And um, so so what what I did was reach out to the people I knew were 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 connected and then it kind of snowballed. I would find more people and also just Googling, like <laughs> just saying Gomban and then finding people's um, blogs or family history websites, finding um, World War II like veterans stories about, about their ancestors. And so I think what I learned is like people, we always we tend to say in historic archeology, span oh, we're giving voice to the voiceless, but you know what? These people have been telling their family histories forever. <laughs> They've been sharing it and they're not, you know, they're not just sitting there like waiting for an archeologist to come dig up their, their past, but definitely there were questions they wanted to know that, that, that aligned with what I wanted to know. And basically they wanted to know how, how they're connected to these people that they know come from the same village, but they're not necessarily like cousins or, or, or grant, you know, they're not closely related. And how did they come to America and how did 
their ancestors live and those are the questions I want to know so so it was a it was a great alignment and you know um without their support and and the oral histories I did and also without their um sharing they shared so many artifacts that they kept letters that they kept from their grandfather's um store or whatever um pictures um directions to their houses in the in the village because the village I'm studying has like a hundred houses and it's it's actually mostly empty so it's hard to figure out who lives where and things like that so um yeah it's so important to to talk to people so if you're an, you want to be an archaeologist because you like artifacts I'm, I'm sorry to say you probably have to talk to people <laughs> thank you Laura thank you um for, for sharing your experiences and, and your research is, is really incredible and it, it bridges so many different um, sort of disciplines of anthropology and history. Um, and as you said, you know, communities have a story, they've been telling their stories. Um, and, you know, I think it's always amazing when we can um, share those stories, you know, as archeologists as well. Um, and Megan, before we get to, open it up for my last question in our discussion. I also want to talk to you about um, collaboration and, and consultation and, and CRM consultation is, is mandated by federal law. Um, I want to also have your perspective on what it looks like um, from the sort of CRM perspective as well. Yeah, it's definitely a slightly different experience than like what Laura was just talking about. And I, I think like in your particular situation, Laura, you're like, well, these people are actually interested in us helping them understand some of their own history. And in my experience, that's not at all what, why we do a lot of consultation, especially in New Mexico, we have, a, you know, it's, we have dozens of Native American groups that are associated with archeological remains in New Mexico and across the Southwest. And like Meredith said, consultation is, is dictated by legislation, but oftentimes it's, it's more about these people, these living communities, they have their own history and they know their own history to be true. They have their own cultural traditions and what, what they have always, it's their history and this is, what, this is what stands with them. They're not necessarily interested in hearing what we have to say about our interpretation of remains that they're claiming as their ancestors. It's more about how can we respect these remains and consult with these tribes to be sure that we're treating everything with respect and we are all in agreement with how these things are going to be dealt with how are we going to excavate these remains how is this whatever this impending project is that's coming through is this all being done in accordance with how the tribal groups want things to be done um, and so there's a whole process um, oftentimes that is kind of spearheaded by the, the agency that's involved. So as a consultant, I'm not necessarily always the one reaching out to the tribes myself. Sometimes the, there's an intermediate that would take care of that, but I'm always involved with that discussion. Um, and then there's, I mean, there's a lot of different situations that can kind of make this spiral into different directions. I mean, obviously there's human remains and that is a whole separate realm of consultation and dealing with tribes. And that's pretty far reaching and very detailed and a whole process in itself. But um, in New Mexico, especially I live in Albuquerque, we're surrounded by reservation lands on almost all sides of the city. So, I mean, we're oftentimes working directly on reservation lands. We're working with local Pueblos, with the Navajo Nation, with different tribal groups. And some of those groups have their own historic preservation department within their, within their Pueblo or within the Navajo Nation. Or, um, their tribal group. And so rather than working with a federal agency or a state agency, we're working directly with them and they are telling us exactly how we're gonna do things. They have their own set of guidelines for the treatment of archeological remains, cultural resources. Um, there's, separate re there's separate treatment for historic resources or modern resources than there are from prehistoric um, earlier remains. There's different treatment for traditional cultural properties, which might be sites that are still used to this present day, but we're still treating them as a cultural site. We're still reporting them and documenting, even though they're technically, you know, they don't re re meet that 50 year threshold to, to make them archeological. Um, so there's a lot that goes into it, but it's definitely a large part of what we do. I mean, we have consultation almost every project that we do, um, even if it doesn't occur on, on Native American lands, like that's, it's a big deal for sure. 
Yeah, thank you, Megan. Um, that's good. And and we're talking, actually, we're spending a couple of weeks talking about uh, Section 106 and using DAPL as a case study in one of my archaeology classes. So I think that a lot of the points that you're making right now and, and that are so well articulated really intersect with some of the conversations that we've been having in, in classes as well. So um, thank you for sharing your perspective. And because it's 545, um, my last question is to all of you before we get to student questions. And if you could pick very quickly, <laughs> this is a lot of pressure, like one bit of advice for, for students who are pursuing archaeology. Um, and here I'm thinking about, you know, field schools or other educational experiences, um, maybe a bit of advice on how to get your foot in the door if you want to pursue a career in, you know, CRM. Or Laura, you talked about um, for students who are wanting to pursue a, you know, a PhD or a master's in archaeology, um, if you could offer like one bit of advice to for these students to take forward in the future, um, what would it be? And I realize again, this is a lot of pressure. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big question. Um, but let's go ahead and um, actually let's start with you, Meg, because you're you're here on my screen. I see you. And then we'll move on. Oh, uh, let's see. I mean, I definitely, so from a CRM standpoint, um, I mean, a lot of the times to do cultural resource management, I mean, a lot of what we do is field-based, especially when you're first getting into this, you're going to be in the field a lot. So I think doing a field school is non-negotiable. I mean, not only because you need it to get a job, but also because there's so many people that do a field school and realize that they don't actually like being outside that much, or they don't like doing archaeology. And I'm like, if that's your shtick, don't don't try to do this. <laughs> like, I'll be honest, like CRM is really hard People who are not okay with being outdoors a lot. I mean, it's essentially manual labor for a lot of what we do, you know, so just keep that in mind. I think that's number one, but also I feel like, and this has been absolutely true for me in my career from day one when I first started doing this, is that so much of what we do is about networking and knowing people because CRM is a really small community. Archaeology in general is a really small community and everybody knows everybody. And so the sooner you can meet some people and meet some people who know some people and then make those connections, even if it's just informally reaching out to people, even if you don't have experience, just sending emails out to companies and saying, you know, here, here's the experience I have. Here's my email. Like, I'd just love for you to keep my name in mind. And then when your name comes up to somebody else, they're like, oh, I remember that person's name, whatever. It just a word of mouth. I mean, almost every job I've ever gotten has been because I knew someone and not because I applied to a position course. So I think that's huge. Just going to events, meeting people, networking. Those are both such great points, Meg. Uh, you have to like being outside or at least be able to tolerate it, which you might find out about yourself later. Um, and you have to just, it's all about connections. It's all about who you know, right? Um, and that's definite. I mean, I guess it's true within the within the academic circles as well, right? It's, you know, when you apply to grad schools, when you apply to jobs, it's all about like making those connections and networking and making sure folks know who you are and that you're available and you're qualified, et cetera. Um, and that, you know, you have recommenders who can speak on your behalf as well. So I think those are excellent points. Um, next, uh, we'll shift over to Lie. Yeah, I also love Megan's <laughs> highlights. It's like, yeah, majority of students, after they go to their field school, they say, whoa, before it's all romantic, like I'm going to do all of these exciting things. And the first eight hours out in the field just kill you, period. <laughs> So yeah, really good. Um, I also agree with connection and it's same here. Like um, many of my undergraduate students who end up, you know, I get to know them and I able to write recommendation letters for them are mostly through research projects. Either they, after they take my course, they come and say, hey, do you have any research opportunity for me? I'm, I'm willing to volunteer my time as long as you have anything for me. Or you can just look for whatever experiential learning opportunities on campus, like look for maybe a professor who's looking for a research assistant, look at what their requirements are and then see if you can apply. And again, also reach out to make the connection, even, even drop, up, um, drop by the office during office hours and then just talk to them, get, get to know, get, let them help them to get to know you and see in the future, if you, if you leave a really good impression in the future, if there's any opportunities come up, 
you may approach them and they will reach out to you as a, hey, I have this opportunity. That happens to me a lot too. So, so that's very important. Yeah, Leah, that's a, also a really good point. Um, you know, it for students to, you know, build those relationships with professors who, um, you know, share their research interests or who have these ongoing projects that they might participate in or volunteer on, um, because that's a good way of getting your foot in the door, right? And that's, that's why we're here as professors, right? We're like here to assist you in building those connections and getting those experiences. So um, definitely reach out to us if, you know, if you hear about projects that they're, that they're doing or research projects that you're interested in, um, or if they know someone else who has a research project, right? It's again, we're all going back to this like connections theme, but um, definitely don't, don't be shy about that because that is really, really important um, in your career as, as burgeoning archeologists. Yeah, even TAs, TAs many times yeah. have lots of resources and connections too. So yeah. make sure to have a positive relationship with your work relationship with your TA. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. That's also a really good point. Um, next, we have Chris. Yes, I have. I have to continue to uh, echo the connections um, topic that we're on. Like, I didn't get in. I got into CRM by having a having coffee for two hours with a friend's parents' friend who worked at a CRM firm, and that's how I was able to get into it. Um, but my biggest, I would say my biggest advice for students in particular is if you're interested in going CRM, much like what Megan said, a field school is required by most CRMs, if not all of them. Um, and a lot of the work tends to be, um, I want scattered is not necessarily the right word, but there's not going to be work all the time. It's all projects are all at different stages. And so it'll be different times that a project will be available that a firm may need someone. So my advice for students who want to go in CRM is uh, start applying to firms early before you graduate, because then these firms know like who you are, what you're interested in, what you can bring to that firm. And you may not even have to only work for them. You actually may end up working for multiple firms at the same time as the project is. But getting your foot in the door, uh, connections and knowing someone and even with and then even down the line when you're working I still get a lot of help from all the people that I know in other areas of archaeology so if I have a question about something with skeletons something, I will reach out to someone who's an expert in that that I know that I have their number so it's very connections are important we're all friends we all help each other out in our archaeological endeavors yeah, Chris, that's a really good point about the sort of contingent nature of a lot of archaeological work, um, especially in the introductory level positions, like the field tech positions, right, where you're out there doing the field work, um, that your employment is contingent upon, you know, having a project that's going. Um, and so you have to, you know, build flexibility into your life plans as an archaeologist, because you might go through periods where there is very little work, you might go through periods where there's a lot of work that's available. Um, and sometimes that can be a, a deal breaker, which is understandable given the sort of like financial constraints, but um, just, you know, sort of know that um, your, your work life will constantly be shifting and it will be in flux. And sometimes you will travel and sometimes you won't have to travel. Um, so, you know, just, I guess my advice would be to plan ahead for that. Um, and then finally, uh, Laura. Okay, like I'll just be quick. You know, my, my story with CRM is different. I tried everything that you all suggested when I was young and starting out and nobody wanted to hire me for any project and basically the my first CRM project um I think they just needed a warm body so <laughs> there's that too like CRM companies sometimes they need somebody they need a group of people like 10 people real quick and if you're one of the 10 people to to apply or you happen to live within 10 miles or 20 miles of where they're based out of, they'll, they'll hire you. So I, I have to say I haven't had a positive <laughs> um, 
relationship with just just cold emailing people, even people who know people that I know. Anyway, in terms of um, so I guess my next advice is you you'll be rejected a lot. Some people won't. Some people just get one job and then they they get promoted and promoted and promoted and and that's that's I've heard that too. But in my case, I've been rejected for everything I've ever. <laughs> like I wanted whatever direction I've wanted to go except for volunteer projects so I would say if you if there's a volunteer project nearby where you can excavate I would I would do that or do an or do something with artifacts so that's it yes rejection is a part of life as an archaeologist <laughs> for certain year. um but it's I mean that's part of I think every sort of you know, profession, um, especially in this current economic cli climate, but, um, but yeah, just to be adaptable, to be flexible, um, I think is really, really, really important within this field. So we have a few minutes, um, and I want to turn the floor over to our audience members, our students included, if you guys have any questions. Um, feel free to either raise your hand and I can call on you, or if you're more comfortable, feel free to, to write your questions in the chat. see two hands, um, both uh, Casey and Katarina, but I don't know who raised their hand first. So Casey, I see you on, I see you on top. So go ahead with your I'll question. Start, yeah. Thank you. I have a question about um, balancing like family life or having children and also working internationally or out of your home area. I, okay, I can say this right now because of my five-year-old is climbing under my chair as I try to speak. Um, so I can't speak about international travel, um, but having family, having kids especially can get quite difficult if you're, sorry, um, if you're uh, in the field a lot, it's pretty difficult. I think what happens a lot for folks who are, especially in CRM, people who are doing kind of that field-based workload beginning of your career, it's pretty common that everybody kind of reaches a point, not everybody, but a lot of folks kind of reach a point. And usually it's, you know, maybe seven years ish in. That's about when it happened for me when you get to the point where it's like, oh, you know, I've been out of town every other week for the last five years for work. And I'd really like to kind of make that transition, maybe start a family. Um, for me, it was, yeah, probably about seven years. I've been in the field almost time on and off. Um, and I got married and, you know, a few years later had a kid and, but it, it worked out well for me at that point that I was also in a career position where I had acquired enough permits. I had enough experience doing what I was doing. I was writing reports that I was able to kind of make that transition career wise at the same time that I was making that transition in my life. Um, and so I was able to kind of, I got lucky, like Chris said earlier, I had a really supportive a co company that I was working for at the time and they were completely understanding of this. So I was able to kind of start making that transition for a while. It was breaking my time between office field work, kind of splitting things up until I was able to kind of transition more into full-time office work. Um, and these days I'm mostly in the office, mostly writing, managing projects and analysis, but I started to go into the Now it's just kind of more on my own terms, which is nice, um, but it's hard. I mean, it's a struggle. I know a lot of people struggle with it um, and it's, so for a lot of people, it's sustainable. It depends a lot on your home situation, you know, especially with kids. It's like, what kind of career does your spouse have or your partner? How can you juggle that back and forth? Some people, it's just not very sustainable. So it's, it's kind of a something everybody has to figure out for themselves. Um, but it, it can be difficult for sure. I mean, that's even having a dog can be difficult sometimes. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Yeah, I would, I would, I'm not a mom or has any child, children, but I, I'd say um, academia probably is the most flexible in terms of doing international research and, and bringing your, your family with you. Um, I can think of like the Wenner grant has like childcare, like you can add that as part of your grant. And then um, if you, if you're a father or mother, I mean, you have paternity and maternity leave in, in, 
if you're a professor and for sure like um you know that's that's important for a lot of people and I, i'm sure some CR, crm companies do that too but um you know the flexibility of academia is is one of the pluses of course people can think of many minuses like <laughs> of um like it's really hard to get a job in in as a professor and and yeah you're kind of um you kind of can't choose where you want to live you kind of have to go with your job there so yeah chris do you want to add to that before we move on to katarina's question okay no i think megan and laura cover everything that i, I had in mind they cover it better, much better than what I had in mind. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, it's I don't have question. kids quite yet. I'm a little young for that, so I can't really speak to that in particular. But I am very young in my career. I am very much looking forward forward to all the opportunities that are given to me. But I'm definitely am at a point where I like my situation I'm in now. I'm a little more settled in the area that I am now, and so it's again like what Megan said before, it's knowing what what works for you and what you're looking for that can really drive where, how far you want to go or where you want to go, what direction in archaeology. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chris. I'm so, so, so sorry, I do, oh, that, sorry, that did remind me of one thing, like, yeah, there, if you really want to take kids with you to the field, as Laura said, just opportunities and Actually, I know lots of people actually it's challenging, but they did take their kids with them on archaeological field work. Um, the other thing is that there are many, many projects. If you are in academia and in the CIM, there are many um, projects in archaeology that you can do without the field work. So that's an option too. And thank you, Leah. That's a really, really good point. Um, there are writing and lab-based positions as well. Um, I noticed, Chris, you put the shovel bumps uh, link in the web or in the chat. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, and I have a bunch of resources that I can share for you as well. Um, so I'll do that uh, over the, the listserv as well or, or email me directly. But I want to um, give some time to Katerina to ask her question next. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your presentations. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, my name is Katarina, and I have a question about for people with intellectual disabilities and or physical disabilities looking to do field work um, and working in anthropology, do you know if um, your employers or supervisors are able to like accommodate people with disabilities within the field of anthropology um, or any ex understanding about that? Um, I don't have a great answer. I don't know that I, I personally haven't, it hasn't come up a lot, I don't think, me, although I do know that my company has, um, I mean, I can speak to my own company, I don't know about others. We have a, a bunch of kind of employee resource groups within our company. Um, we're a nationwide company, we have a lot of different offices, and so we have a, we have a disability resource group where a number of our employees who identify with that um, are involved in this resource group to support each other, and they have meetings, we have other resource groups for lots of other um, groups as well with the organization. So I know that there are a number of folks in our organization um, in that situation. I don't know about the work necessarily. I have, I have a sense that some of those might be more lab-based or office-based off, uh, positions, but I actually don't know the answer to that right off. So that's, that's all I can offer. If I would say if you have, if there are, physical limitations when it comes to field work. Um, I mean, it is field work and it can be strenuous depending on the conditions it is because we work in both when it's sunny, if it's raining, if it's windy. I mean, there's a whole set of environmental factors in our work too. But I will say most of the time, um, employers will be understanding that. And if you just talking with your about what your limitations are in that regard, they will find a way to accommodate that. Because it is strenuous work and we don't want you to get injured. We, safety on sites is the number one 
thing. Safety comes first. So Katarina, that's such a, such a good question. It's such an important question. And it's actually um, a topic that has been discussed um, really quite frequently in archaeology, especially as of late. And I just posted a very scary looking link in the chat, but it's to a, an article that was, it's a little bit older now, but it was um, co-authored by Roberta, uh, Roberta Gilchrist, who is uh, an archaeologist in the UK. Um, and she talks a lot about how um, archaeology has historically been a very uh, sort of exclusive discipline, um, right? And has really focused on a very specific skill set um, and a set of expectations. But uh, recently, I think a lot of academic communities and also cultural resource management companies are, um, you know, having conversations with employees. And of course, it depends on the company, it depends on the university, depends on the support system about ways uh, in which uh, you know, these companies, in this case, can create an environment for, for everyone, all of their employees to thrive. Um, so I think we're at sort of like a dialogical uh, part of this, of this process right now, which I think is a good first stage. Um, but I think that this is, like I said, a very, very important uh, question and one that's been, um, or a topic that's been discussed a lot about making archaeology more inclusive. And making it more inclusive from from different perspectives. Um, so have a look at this, and and I'm happy to talk with you, Katarina, or um, you know share other resources. I don't want to bombard everyone <laughs> in the chat, but that can also go into my archaeology resources as well. Um, there's been some really 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 good work done. Um, also look into uh, I'll type her name into the chat. Barb Voss has done a lot of really excellent work. Um, in archaeology on this topic. But thank you for your question, Katarina. Does anyone else want to jump in? I see Luisa's hand. Yeah, oh, sorry. yeah sorry. go ahead, Laura. Oh, um, I would say that um, if you're doing a field school, I think I think the field school director will, ha will have to accommodate um, students who have disabilities. So don't let that um, don't let that discourage you from doing a field school. And I know people who who had a disability, who did um, do that, who, who did participate in, in field research. And I think, um, yeah, there are some people active, especially on Twitter, who, who are disabled in some way and are, they, they, they advocate for, for archaeologists who, um, yeah, have disabilities or, or neurodiversity. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the, the Twitter sphere well, might be a place to, <laughs> to go as well. Um, Luis, Luis, let's go I see your hand. All right, thank you all for, it was such a great presentation. Um, I have a question. So let's say if you get down with field school, um, is CRM the only place that you can find a job or are, are there any other options for finding a job? Uh, National Park Service, Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management. Um, what else? <laughs> Army Corps, U.S. Army Corps. There's all, there's, I'm sorry, these are all government agencies. And then there's also California State Parks, since you're in California. Um, maybe certain cities even have, like archaeologists. Uh, other people can jump in. Yeah, definitely. I was going to suggest also the the agency avenue is a very popular way to go, especially out of undergrad. There's a number of um, programs like Forest Service has some really great programs for seasonal employment for folks that are just out of undergrad. Um, and that's something that people can do a lot, especially when you're just out of school, maybe, maybe still unsure if you're completely sold on archeology span as a career, like that's kind of a perfect thing to do. It's like get a seasonal temp job with the Forest Service or apply for those sorts of agency jobs if you get on that lower level. Um, another nice thing about the agencies, it's nice when you're starting your career, not so good if you're further into your career, is that they really like to promote from within. And so people who have gotten in on the ground floor with an agency of the Forest Service, the BLM, are going to have better luck with the trajectory of moving up within those agencies throughout a career. If that's sort of, sort of position that you'd like to have. 
I mean, there's a lot of pros and cons you could discuss about working for the government. Um, some people really love that sort of thing. There's a lot of bureaucracy and benefits, you know, I mean, that's a whole separate, a separate thing. Um, but there's a lot of positions in that realm. Um, obviously the CRM, there's always gonna be a lot of kind of like early entry level positions, CRM looking for work and lab work and stuff like that. But I mean, there's also museums, there's internships, there's, I mean, city planning offices, there's all sorts of different, different avenues where people are still needing cultural resources and needing archeologists um, and maybe even, you know, cultural anthropology type of positions. Um, Certainly depending on where you are or what you're looking to do. I mean, straight out of undergrad, there might be some limitations. Um, some of the higher level stuff, I mean, obviously some people are gonna ask for more um, experience or a master's level type. That's, I think there's still a lot of openings at that lower level that just kind of, again, just throw those feelers out, cast a wide net, see what you can find. Um, somebody mentioned volunteer opportunities earlier. That's a great way to get in the ground and meet people as well, state parks local organizations. Yeah, I think that's all really great advice. Um, and and Luis or anyone else um, that's here right now, and, and I'll send this out, like I said, to all the listservs, is I do have a running list of, of places where you can go to look for, for archaeology positions, um, mostly entry-level positions, volunteer positions all around the state of California. Um, so there are already resources that exist, and, and I'm happy and you know, I'm sure our participants are, would be happy, your speakers would be happy to, um, to share future information with you as well and, and discuss these opportunities. Um, so I'll be sending those out as well. But um, as everyone said, there are multiple different agencies where you can find work. Um, so there are many options if you just have to know where to look. So that's what we're here for. Um, any, I think we have time for one last question because we are over time, but um, if there's any last burning questions. Casey, I see your hand. Ah, and I see another one too, but I can't scroll. Casey and then Jonathan. Um, just like out of curiosity, I'm wondering what your personal experiences were like with field schools or where you went to them and what you were doing. Was it for uh, my field school, I was in Italy for three weeks excavating um, human uh, remains at a medieval monastery. So I spent three weeks, ex five days a week, nine, 10 hours a day learning just how to, one, just properly excavate, because that's what you do learn a lot in the, at a field school is just how do you do archaeology and the proper method of doing it. And so, I both, I not only did I get to learn how to do it physically, but also also how to actually engage with, with field and how to do the work itself. And it was amazing. It was a lot of fun. You meet a lot of friends in field school that I still keep up with today. And we even meet up sometimes. So it's, it is a great experience. Yeah, I, uh, I'm not being hyperbolic when I say that field school was one of the most fun things I've ever done in my life. Like I still, I, I love field school so much I did a second one. Um, so when I was in undergrad, um, I applied for a summer field school that was semi-local. It was a few hours away in New Mexico. Um, and I knew I wanted to work in the Southwest, so I stayed local. Um, and I did a summer field school through Washington State University. They were working down here in New Mexico. So I went and spent six weeks living in my tent using an outhouse that the grad students had dug by hand, showering with the garden hose and loving every second of it. Um, we were pretty much roughing it, excavating a, a, a Pueblo in room block. Um, so we were digging some really amazing stuff and I just had an absolute blast. And while I was there that summer, UNM, where I was going to school, announced that they were going to be doing a field school the following fall during the school semester at Chaco Canyon National Park. And so I immediately like registered for that too. I was like, well, absolutely, I, I want to do that. Like, so I don't care if I need it. 
Um, so then that fall, I also went and did a field school where I got to live out at Chaco Canyon in my tent for six weeks and excavate there, which was a pretty unique experience. Um, and so I got to work at the Park Service through that field school, which was pretty amazing as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, just like Chris said, I met, I met friends, you know, and that was 15 years ago when I went to field school and I still keep in touch with some of those people. I've worked with some of those people um, and, and some of those professors that I worked with as well. I, you know, maintain those contacts and some of those people were in the field school for four days and realized they absolutely hated it and ne never have touched archaeology since, you know, so it, it can go either way. Um, but I think it, I think, think about where you, for me, it was like, what do I want to do? I want to, I want to work in the Southwest. And so I wanted to stay around the Southwest for my field school. But if you're unsure and you, you know, a lot of people take field school as an opportunity to go to Europe, go somewhere cool, go work in a medieval castle or whatever the thing may be. Um, but there's a lot of opportunities. I mean, field schools are all over the world and that's one cool thing about it, especially if you can find a way to get a scholarship or some funding to help you get there, like take advantage of that for sure. Yeah, I did it. I'm sorry, Laura, go good. Ahead. I I'd say um I pro I, I did a volunteer project in near my hometown, I guess, of Los Angeles. And it was not camping, it was people were staying in a hotel, which was nice. So I think for your first experience, I would say if you if you grew up in an urban environment like I did maybe look for something that is a little more comfortable because I did have an offer to work for the Forest Service volunteer for three months in like eight hour drive in the middle of nowhere near the Oregon of, of, of Oregon and California. And when I saw an opportunity to be a little closer to home, I was like, okay, I, I, I quit. I, I basically said no to the other job, the remote one and did the one closer to home and I, I don't regret it because the first day, that was my first time doing archaeology and I hated it. I hated the first day. It was hot. It was, um, it was hard work, like manual labor, but it was like other people. It was the, it was the people that kept me, um, like made it fun. And then over time, it, it's, um, you know, you get stronger, really you do. <laughs> and so I say, um, don't be afraid of the manual labor. Yeah, and, and take ibuprofen um, and definitely uh, try, try it out. If you don't think archaeology is for you, um, try to look for something close to home or close to like where, where you don't have to camp. Um, and then and that also helps you with um, getting paid internships because with paid internships or field schools, um, they want to see experience. And, and so actually my, my official field school was a, uh, National Science Foundation research experience for undergraduates and these they not only paid for my like living situation but they paid me a stipend and so um, those are those are really competitive I'll put the link there um, and then yeah of course like uh, Megan says the the doing well in the field school or any project even if it's volunteer makes you look good and, and then you get a recommendation for the next project or next field school or even for graduate school which is where all my letters came from is from outside of my university because I I did not talk I didn't talk in class <laughs> so if you're shy you can still be an archaeologist <laughs> So I just want to jump in for a minute and then we need to, we actually need to close um, our discussion because uh, in the interest of our, our speaker's time, but um, I think there's a couple of really good points. First of all is, you know, pick a field school opportunity that, you know, fits with your current living situation, that fits with your interests and fits with your needs, because there are a lot of field schools. Um, uh, and I dropped a link to the American Institute of Archaeology has a running list of field opportunities that's in the chat. Um, I'll also send that out again to you all. Um, so there's that. The second thing I would advise is just make sure that, you know, it's a uh, quote unquote legitimate field school so that they're actually offering, um, you know, training opportunities to students. Some, some field schools can be a little bit predatory in the sense that they're just looking for students to work through a collection of material or do a particular task. 
uh, in the interests of the field school director and you won't get the same level of like experiences and, and training that you might receive elsewhere. So if there's a field school that you're really interested in, but you're like, I don't know about this field school, I don't know what you know the jargon is, um, you know, send it to someone to just double check. Be like, do you know the project directors? Do you know anything about this field school? And, and we're happy to, you know, provide advice on it. And the last thing too is that, yes, a lot of field schools um, are about like excavation and survey and that sort of like field work aspects. But there are a lot of field schools and a lot of projects that are looking for folks to do lab work, to work with, you know, archaeological collections, to clean the collections. I did a field school um, in Greece once and then went on to be a supervisor for about five or six years. But we had students help with like the GIS and the mapping. We had students who were doing like the zooarchaeology and working with faunal remains. We had students who were doing all the work with the pottery, the ceramics and, you know, cleaning artifacts, doing the macrobotanical stuff. So um, yes, a lot of field schools are geared towards excavation, but you can find uh, a number of opportunities um, for, you know, sort of non-excavation uh, settings and, and other kinds of archeological lab work. and and mapping and writing and, and things like that. So um, do so seek those out as well. Um, I think that's important. Okay, so the A, I realize it's very late where you are <laughs> and probably for some of Thanks. for others too. Um, so I do wanna end even though we're over time. Um, but I want to I want to thank again all of our our speakers today um, for their you know shared experiences and, and expertise and thank you all for joining and it was selfishly it was wonderful to see you all again um, and I will share resources as well um, feel free to email me directly you can find me on the interwebs um, if you're interested in getting more resources. Uh, Laura says, feel free to email her if you want to connect. So um, do, do, do take those opportunities. And for all of you who, who came to our event, thank you so much. Um, it was really wonderful, wonderful to have this conversation with you. Um, Thanks. I will, I will get the, Ariel says, how do we get the recording? Uh, I will, <laughs> I will get it to Ariel. I will send it out to our undergrad list if you're on it. I'll send it out to the ASA if you're part of their, our student organization, and I'll send it out to our graduate list as well. We can post it to our YouTube. Talia says she'll post it to our YouTube channel, uh, so we'll do that as well. And Megan has kindly said um, that she will address any questions about CRM, as did Chris. So thank you all. This is great. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Great. This is awesome. Yeah. Yeah, Thanks, actually, everyone. I would like to have the um, yeah. recording and maybe yes. even the chat too for my students. I think yes. they will be very excited to see this. Very awesome. Very informative. Thank you. Great. Yeah, I'll send it to you, Lie. And 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 Talia, um, one of our students will post it to our uh, our department's YouTube channel as well. So. Yeah, and feel free to pass along my information as well. Okay. Thank you, Lie. All right, everyone. Take care. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Thanks, Thank, everybody. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Good night.